Hey there, thanks for stopping by Behind the Badgers podcast. Today is April 30th, 2020. We are safer at home doing our social distancing podcasting, but excited and happy that we can bring some Badger content and some distraction for you. I'm Patrick Herb. Brian Mason is with me. Well, he's not with me. He's on the, he's on the Zoom call with me. Uh, for those of you who are watching, hello. And for those of you who are listening, thanks for checking us out. Uh, Brian, the NFL draft just happened. We finally had some sports content to consume. It was Thursday, Friday, Saturday. How many hours do you think you spent in front of a TV following the draft? I watched the whole thing, man. What do you, <laughs> no, you why, would, why would I, why would I know? What else did I have to do? No, I oh, watched, your wife I watched, must really love you. My daughter on Saturday said, there's another draft today. And I said, <laughs> yes, yes. The last of the draft is today. And it was a good draft for the Badgers, including for Zach Bond, who's going to join us today. As our guest, uh, we're excited to have Zach because I think he ended up in a great spot going to the New Orleans Saints in the third round. Um, but we'll get to all that and hear from Zach here in a minute. Yeah, we, we covered a lot of ground with him and what it's like being a draft pick who normally you'd fly right to your city, in this case, New Orleans, and jump into rookie mini camps and OTAs. And he's just still sitting here in Madison. So it's a strange time. But, but boy, you can hear it in his voice how excited he is to go to New Orleans of, of all the teams. It seems like it's an unbelievable fit for him. Brian, let's break down the draft a little bit in terms of and talk about where all the Badgers went and what happened last weekend. Um, Jonathan Taylor, first Badger to be drafted, second round pick to the Indianapolis Colts. What was your reaction um, to the fact that, one, that Wisconsin didn't have a first round pick when some people thought maybe Vaughn or JT would be? Uh, but then you hear that he goes, to, he goes to, to Indianapolis, a team that trades up to get him. What was your reaction? Well, I think, first of all, on the whole first round thing, I mean, both of those guys were sort of projected toward the end of the first round, potentially, or into the second. So JT ends up falling close to where people had him projected. Zach fell a little farther than most people had him projected. But as much as I would like the brag points to say that the Badgers had a first round pick, um, what it really comes down to, in my mind, is where they end up. Because in the league, it's all about getting in a place where you can be successful. And I think in both of those guys' cases, they both ended up in good situations. Jonathan going to Indianapolis, um, you know, that's a, that's a strong franchise. Chris Ballard, the GM, is a Badger. He got to make his first pick of a Badger by taking JT in the second round. Um, but I like the idea of Jonathan Taylor working behind that Colts offensive line. I think he can be really productive there. They've got Marlon Mack already, who's going into his fourth year and was a thousand yard rusher last year. But Frank Reich, their head coach, said he wants to have a one-two punch there. He wants to have running back by committee. And you would think that JT has a really good shot to sort of be their running back of the future and wouldn't shock either of us sitting here if he was the running back of the present this year as well. Yeah, there's people talking about him as one of the leading candidates for rookie of the year already, just kind of forecasting that out. And yeah, based on his track record, that shouldn't surprise anybody. The impact of not going in the first round is a little bit financial, I would say, for these guys. But to be honest, the, where, where these guys are going to make their money and where they're going to make their impact financially is in that second contract. So that's, exactly. that's, that's what you mean. Like, it's more important to get the right fit and make sure you're still there in year five or year six when you can actually cash in and become the feature player on that team. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the, the salary structure reduces throughout the first round. So you get to the point where getting in a favorable position to get to that second contract really is, the, from a financial standpoint, the payoff is, is being somewhere where you can, you can do that. And like you saw T.J. Watt, the, the Steelers just picked up his fifth-year option. And so he's going to be waiting on that second contract a little bit yet. But establishing yourself in the NFL is so important, especially for a running back where – we've talked about the change in how running backs are used, how they're perceived, what their value is. So for a guy like JT to have the chance to emerge as the number one guy, but not immediately have the pressure to have to be the number one guy, I think is a good thing for him. Yeah. Forward. Here's what you like about his situation, or at least here's what I like about it. So the owner, Jim Ursay lobbied for him, for the Colts to pick him. He, uh, he's a guy who doesn't often stick his nose in terms of personnel moves or drafts, but he's on the record as saying that he was, he wanted him. He wanted him as a player when he was, when he found out he was available in that second round, you go to, you go to an offense that has proven that they will run the ball the, in a lot of offenses where they're spreading it out and running run the damn ball, run the damn <laughs> ball specifically. I mean, I got to ask JT if he's got one of those hats yet. 
and from the Colts. He's got a quarterback in Philip Rivers now, who a veteran quarterback and a leader. That that's it's gonna be, a, you know, that's a stable situation. Even though he's new to the team, at least he's got a nice quarterback with him. And he's playing on turf, JT on turf. Man, that guy's fast on turf. He's fast everywhere, but he's fast on turf. All right, let's move to Zach Bond and his situation. We're going to talk to him about it firsthand. Another guy that was traded up for in New Orleans. What was your reaction to where he got picked? Yeah, I mean, the Saints only had four draft picks, so they were in a situation where they were really trying to make things count. And so for them to feel like they couldn't sit back where they were at in the end of the second round and get Zach, one of the guys they wanted, and they had to trade up to get him, I think that speaks to – how much they valued him. So again, you could look at overall his value might have come in under what was projected because he slid to the third round, but you had a team that certainly saw the value in him to trade up and go get him. And it's a team that is as we'll talk to, with him in a minute about this, but it's about as stable a situation as you can be going into. Um, and then there's a team that is a contender right off the bat. They were a play away from the Super Bowl two years ago. They've made the playoffs and been really strong the last three years so you know he's a piece where he can come in and help sort of hopefully for that franchise get him over the hump a little bit and get him get him to the Super Bowl but that's that's not a stretch to think that he could he could play a role in that as well yeah, it's, com- it's comforting to go to a place that you know really wanted you and so New Orleans is on the record of saying they tried they didn't have a second round pick they tried to trade up into the second round to get him so yeah he's a third round pick but New Orleans makes it sound like if they had a second round pick he'd have been their second round pick so that that that's good it's also when we had him on the podcast in the fall, we talked about his traveling and all the places that he'd been to and where, where his favorite one was. And he said it was New Orleans. So I don't know if he was laying the seeds back then to be drafted by the Saints. If so, he's a pretty smart dude. Uh, but it, maybe it was serendipity that he got picked by New Orleans. That was, that was absolutely the first thing that came to my mind was him talking about his love of visiting New Orleans. And then my other thought was about Bobby April, the Badgers outside linebackers coach, who's coached Zach the last couple of years, and his Louisiana connections – Sure. Um, having grown up there and how excited he was to see Zach end up with the Saints. That was A, for the football side of it, and B, for the, you know, the guy, a guy who has a cultural appreciation for everything Louisiana. And he'll be back with Ryan Ramchek, who he was teammates with a few years ago. All right, moving on. Tyler Biotish goes fourth round to Dallas. There's a theme here. Yet another team that traded up to get a Badger. This one's really interesting because – he is, in essence, replacing Travis Frederick, the former Badger, who just retired from Dallas and also played the same position. Other than that, what, what was your takeaway from Biotish going fourth round at Dallas? Well, he's sort of a similar situation. He's joining a, a franchise that is one of the best in the NFL, and he's joining an offensive line that over the last few years has been one of the best in the league. So he's got a chance to not have to be the guy right away and carry that whole group. Um, but he's also going to have to fight for the job. They've got other guys on the roster that are going to compete to be the starting center alongside him. Um, it's a lot of pressure on Tyler, I think, or there's a potential for a lot of pressure on him to come in and fill the same role that Travis Frederick filled so well for that franchise for all those years. I mean, he was an all-pro. He was a perennial pro bowler. And the connection, the comparison will be so easy for people to make that here is this Wisconsin center He's the next Travis Frederick. I mean, I, th- I do. I think Tyler's going to be a long-term pro. I think he's going to have a great career. But being compared to a guy like Travis Frederick out of the gate, and Mike McCarthy, their head coach, even said so on draft day, you know, I don't want to put a lot of pressure on him, but here comes another great Wisconsin offensive lineman, and we're, we're happy to have him. Yeah, and that, again, it's another great franchise that he's going to. I went down to Dallas in the fall and saw their new training facilities and their, like, Jerry World satellite campus the star yeah i've been there oh my goodness yeah unbelievable he for that alone he's walking into a good situation it's crazy yeah all right quintez cephas was the next badger off the off the board fifth round draft pick to detroit were you surprised he went fifth round uh was that about where you expected him to go i don't know that anything was going to be a surprise with q just because there were so many wide receivers in the in the draft class and where he would shake out I think was a total wild card so the fact that he as you saw more coming off the board and he and his name was not among them it really became okay I you didn't know when you didn't know to who you didn't know where um but another guy who okay being a fifth round draft pick is not as ego boosting as being a third round pick say 
but a guy who's going to a place in Detroit where you've got an established quarterback in Matthew Stafford. You've got a, a, a team that likes to throw the ball. I mean, he's going to have competition for those, those catches and those targets. Um, but they're not afraid to air it out in Detroit. And a guy who sort of like you brought up with JT, who's going to get to play half his games inside on turf. Yeah. He's, he's joining a crowded wide receiver group. I mean, they, Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones, Danny Amendola all had 60 plus catches. They're all names in the NFL. They're veteran receivers. They just added Geronimo Allison this year too, the former Packer. They signed him to a free agent. So it's a crowded room, but we know Cephas is talented and probably has a, you know, has a shot on that team. But I, I also thought I saw a CBS sports article where they evaluated the top pick of every franchise and they had Cephas as the best pick that the Lions made. And they also had Zach Vaughn as a top pick that the Saints made. So like that, sometimes, like we've talked about, where you go, what round doesn't necessarily matter. It's, it's value and it's fit and it's scheme and what, what, you, what you can add to that franchise. So I, it seems like a pretty good situation for him. Yeah, I think, I think Tyler and Q both have that, that opportunity to prove their team's you know, the proof that their teams found a real value in making that pick where they did, that they got somebody who's probably better than where they fell in the draft order. So I, Q too, I mean, everybody, everybody got caught up in that four, seven, three that he ran in the 40 at the combine. The interesting number that I saw post draft from pro football focus is that he was the best receiver in the class in terms of his contested catch rate. So it, it sort of quantified something that we saw on live action in games, you know, with his ability to go up and get the ball and make these plays and contested catches. Um, I thought Vice that was, grips, man. His yeah, hand. I thought that that was a really interesting way to look at his game that the measurable wasn't, wasn't as good as he wanted, but the way he played is what the lions drafted. Okay. The undrafted sweepstakes, Chris Orr goes to the Carolina Panthers. Uh, you've probably talked to Chris since, since the draft. What, what did you hear about his experience uh, and what that looked like after, after the draft is over? Yeah, I mean, epitome of a guy who just needs a chance. He's a, he's a guy that we talked about last week on here based on size, based on production, based on a lot of factors. He's going to not fit um, the, the number one linebacker mold for NFL teams. But he's a guy that can really carve out a niche for himself, who can find a role based on how he plays and how he – how he works for a team. Cause he's a guy who's going to come in and maximize everything that he can do. He's a guy who's going to play well on teams. I mean, this was, this is a guy who was the special teams player of the year voted by his teammates at Wisconsin two years ago as a linebacker. It wasn't a kicker. It wasn't a return returner. It was a guy who played the four core units as a linebacker. So he's got a chance, I think, to be like a Chris Maragos, a guy who comes in and carves out that, that spot for himself as a special teams guy and finds a way to stick around and finds a way to stick around. And next thing you know, he becomes an NFL veteran. I mean, I, I think we all know that Chris plays far beyond what he measures, sort of like I just brought up with Q. And I, I think he's a guy who, in the right spot with the right opportunity, can absolutely carve out an NFL career. So that was last week's news, the NFL draft. This week, the big news was, came on Wednesday when the NCAA announced some legislation for the name, image, and likeness. We'll get to that in just a minute. Right now, staying in touch is more important than ever. So to help you stay connected during this unprecedented time, U.S. Cellular is waiving data overages. That means there's no charges if you go past your cap. Now through May, they're going to be doing that. No matter what plan you have, you'll have smartphone data that you need and not be charged for overages. So you can do your homeschooling and your Zoom calls, and you can do a podcast from your basement like we are. So even if we have to be apart during this time, we can stay in touch thanks to U.S. Cellular. All right, Brian, Wednesday, bombshell news. The Board of Governors outlined specific areas which college athletes could be compensated for the use of their name, image, and likeness. When they approved by the membership, these rules would allow athletes to have compensation for third-party endorsements related to athletics without school or conference involvement, compensation for other student-athlete opportunities like social media, new businesses, personal appearances, as long as it doesn't involve the use of trademark or logos. So now a formal proposal will be submitted no later than October to the NCAA board who will vote no later than January, probably a formality. 
These new rules are expected to take effect at the start of the 21-22 academic year, so a year from now. Interesting, huge, possible landscape changing uh, news from the NCAA. I think it's a step that probably has been a long time coming, but there's a lot of question marks before it. And the NCAA admitted that. Mark Emmert, the, the, the president of NCAA, said that there's a lot to be worked out. There's some words in there that are, that are interesting, like putting guardrails is the word they used, uh, about kind of shepherding some of this. Uh, what is market value? What is allowed? What is not? What was your reaction, Brian, when you, when you read that news on Wednesday morning? My initial reaction is that I, I'm glad we're starting to come toward a resolution on this. I think it's silly to think that this is the answer and this is the final product because, as was alluded to, there are a number of steps left in this process. There are voices that are going to be heard. There's votes that are going to be cast. So I think what the final product looks like will probably be at least somewhat different from this framework that was presented this week. Um, and there's no question that there's probably at this point still more questions. There's no question. There's more questions. There's a question because there's lots of questions. <laughs> we have more questions than we have answers at this point. Um, but the times have changed and the NCAA acknowledged this. The, the times have changed. And to keep up with that, this is something that needs to happen. And I think how it ends up playing out and what the details look like, on the whole, this will be an opportunity for student athletes to improve their situation. This will be an opportunity for all student athletes. This isn't something that is only going to benefit the quarterback on the football team or the potential lottery pick on the men's basketball team. This is something that I think student athletes across the board can take advantage of because there seems to be this thought out there that name image likeness is, is going to come down to which car dealer is you know, sponsoring which student athlete and all that. that. That sort of thing I think will probably remain the outlier. What is more interesting to me is how student athletes will be able to leverage their presence on social media to find a way to make some money off of their name, image, and likeness because social media is the ubiquitous part of all of this. And it's the thing that it doesn't matter necessarily what position you play or the success of your team, you have a voice and you can, and you can use it. And this is now an avenue for you to use it for your own gain. Yeah, I think for every Zion Williamson there is that would that would probably have big time endorsement deals. There's thousands of other Division One athletes in football and basketball, main sports, hockey, volleyball, that that will have minimal maybe impact on them. Some, but not a ton. I, but we talk about these questions. I, I think that one is that the California legislation is set to go into effect January one, so that doesn't line up with the NCAA's deadline. So that's an interesting thing. Will agents be able to get involved? This is, there's a lot of uh, tax concerns for kids who are now getting endorsements and things like that. That's an interesting thing, how that will work, how the, how the universities will uh, play a complementary role to student athletes and helping them either find endorsements or manage them. How does that work out from a compliance standpoint? Um, also, how about who establishes what fair market value is? You know, I, I, I think fair market value by definition is what someone's willing to pay you for something. So, uh, but I know the NCAA has some ideas of putting some, not necessarily limiting earning potential, but making sure that things line up that, okay, yeah, that's an appropriate amount for that action. Um, also, how do shoe contracts work in there? So Wisconsin is a, is a partner with Under Armour. And so what kind of, does Under Armour partner with student athletes? Are they, uh, you know, a lot of questions that, that, will be interesting to see how they unfold the next few months. Yeah, I think at a, at a start, it's, it's what you reference with the California law, because now you've seen a number of states coming out with their own provisions that are all different. And will there be involvement from the federal government to sort of level that out? Or will it be left on a state-by-state -state basis? Will government leaders see what the NCA is doing as enough to pull back from their involvement? Or is it a chance to say, see they're not doing as much as we think they should and we're going and this is why the government needs to be involved. So that to me is the biggest part of this. And then once you get through that it's it's the third party stuff you reference who helps manage this system, who helps provide guidance for the student athletes because you're talking about again they're adults but you're talking about people who are young and have not gone through these things before and who's going to help provide some guidance so that they don't go down the wrong road or they don't get in business with the wrong people that sort of thing. Um, finding that sweet spot between free-for-all and 
um, a system that that helps make sure they they have what they need to to do this successfully. I think is the is the challenge. And and where where does the NCA fall on that? Where do the schools fall on that? Where do agents? Where do third parties that help manage the rights and the the deals themselves? How all of that works, I think, is a lot to figure out. Um, that we're going to have to see how it plays out uh, up until this thing comes to a vote um, in January, probably. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Either way, pretty groundbreaking. Wednesday was a pretty big day that that the NCAA is is formally working towards taking that step and, and acknowledging that 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 is the evolution uh, of NCAA athletics. Brian, we've been doing this for for the last few weeks of trying to highlight Badgers who are doing good things during this this uh, pandemic era. Uh, you had a couple football players that, that you wanted to mention, didn't you? Yeah, Leon Jacobs um, is a guy who is from California, from the L.A. area. He donated some meals to hospital and frontline staff out there uh, to support what they're doing to, to uh, battle COVID. Uh, and then Melvin Gordon, a guy I've brought up a few times on this pod for the good work that he's done in different areas, uh, obviously just signed with the Denver Broncos. He's already trying to make an impact in that community. He he donated uh, pallets, pallets and pallets worth of protein products to the police and fire department in Denver. Um, got a shout out from the mayor for his involvement. Obviously, that's going to be a big part of what Melvin brings to Denver is that he's not only a great player, he's going to be this great, this great citizen. So uh, cool to see him extending his charitable efforts to his new city. I want to shout out Nigel Hayes to big, big popular Badger still doing good things. And he's, he's always been a guy who's uh, much bigger than basketball. Uh, but j- just recently, he raised $8,000 in a week for the Toledo area community. He did it by using the profits from his new uh, apparel company that he started called Wise God. Uh, and he matched the proceeds that came from uh, sales from, his, from that t-shirt and apparel company. He matched those with his own money. And then he partnered with some local restaurants uh, to even make that larger. And what I thought was cool is that he took that money and he wanted to invest it back into the community. So he bought gift cards to local grocery stores and restaurants. Then he took those to the MLK Kitchen for the Poor and Mom's House, a child care center for low-income single mothers who are trying to finish high school and college and give those to that organization that they could then distribute them to people in the community that need them. So shouts to you, Nigel Hayes, Malvin Gordon, Leon Jacobs, all good things. Hey, if you know a Badger who's doing good things, drop us a line, let us know. It doesn't even have to be a sports related. A Badger who maybe didn't play sports but is out in the, out in the community doing good things right now, we want to hear from you. S- send us a tweet at Behind Badgers or drop us an email, BehindTheBadgers at gmail.com. Send us who's doing good in the world and we want to give them credit for it. A guy who's about to do really good things in the world is our guest. Let's hear from Zach Bond. He was sporting his brand new New Orleans Saints cap when we talked to him. Third round pick, one of our favorites. Zach, congratulations, man. I'm, I'm so excited for you. On behalf of Badger fans everywhere, we're proud of you. Congratulations on being drafted by the Saints. Has the, has the high worn off yet? I don't think it'll ever wear off. <laughs> it, the feeling I felt as soon as the phone lit up and rang, was unlike any other I really didn't know how to react and I'm I still don't like know how to take it all in but I'm trying all right take us through what that process was like and let's start with Thursday because Thursday was probably a little painful so you were projected by some people as a first round draft pick Thursday was a first round of the draft what did you do Thursday what that look like in your life yeah so my family and my girlfriend's family went over to um, my girlfriend's parents house in Kewaskum and uh, just a small get together, um, not too many people. Um, I knew there was a little, a slight chance, but um, not much of a chance that I would go in the first round on the first day. So we were just kind of watching it. Um, I wasn't anticipating, didn't set any standards or anything. And if I got the call, I got the call and it was a, a good moment. But um, that day went by, uh, no harm done. Um, and then Friday came around. And I thought I was going to be one of the first picks. And um, I thought uh, my agent told me the sweet spot was like 25 to 40 um, overall. And as soon as that 40 went up, I was like, oh, man, okay. Um, It's got to be sometime soon. I'm going to get that call. And then 
kept going. My my hands were sweating. My back was sweating. <laughs> my knee was bouncing. And uh, once it hopped, once I went into the third round, I started texting my agent like, "Yo, uh, I don't know what what's going on, or um, if I said something wrong in my interviews or something." Um, but it's like I said, as soon as my phone lit up, um, all those uh, anxious emotions went away, and it was nothing but pure joy. Were the Saints a team that you had a good feeling about? I mean, sometimes guys get an idea of where they think they might end up. Were, were they a team that was on your list of, you know, okay, I've got a good feeling that they, they like me? See, I met them at the senior game, like in, in a formal meeting setting. I met their um, GM, their head coach, their linebacker coach, and they sat me down in a room. Um, their interview was not like many others. They uh, – taught you their defense. Like we watched film, they taught you, you their defense. You got to use a little notepad. And then um, coach just clicked through some, some plays and said, what's the call here? What, what side does the safety come down to? Stuff like that. And I thought I did very well. And then I didn't have much uh, follow-up after that until the combine. I met with their linebacker coach again. Um, I didn't think much of it. And then after that, they were kind of completely off my radar. So um, it was one of those teams where it's like, okay, it's one of those teams where you maybe didn't think about, but um, nonetheless, happy, happy about it. So when the phone rings, who's on the other end? Who, who called you? It was the assistant GM. Yeah, saying so that, you're going to be a saint. <laughs> so and then, and then, go ahead. And then it took a while for them because they traded up. It took a while for the they, they called me before the trade was confirmed. So I was like, oh, man, oh, man, okay. <laughs> like, the trade might not go through. And then they were talking about, like, a backup plan. And I'm like, oh, shoot, what, what's going on here? And then they like, like all right, Zach, we're locked in. Um, we're going to pick you in the next few picks here. Hold on tight. And I just went crazy. <laughs> so you had some lead time, in other words. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because Chris Orr said to me, he goes, I was the first to know. Like, we had asked him to send in a video, you know, like congratulating you. And he's, he sends me the video and it's, he's rolling on the screen as your pick. Like he knew it was coming and he was so stoked. He said, I was the first to know. So he it was. had to be because you had that lead done. I did. I did. I texted. I, he was the first person I texted. So Zach, so when, uh, like on Thursday, were you hearing from anybody? Like, did, like, I'm curious how this works. Like, do some teams say, hey, we're, we're, they want to talk to you, like, we're thinking about you, or we're giving you a heads up? Or even in that second round, when, when the picks are going by, are you hearing from teams or anybody? Or is it really just you and your agent communicating? Yeah, I wasn't hearing from any teams. I know, um, like Chris Orr said, he had some communications with, with the Panthers and other teams leading up to um, the draft, but I didn't have anything. Uh, it was just – uh, a waiting game for me. Yeah, you're just in the dark. That has to be excruciating. And, and now, do you remember when Aaron Rodgers like fell in the draft and they had the camera on him like the whole time in that first yeah. round? Yeah. Like I, those thoughts would have been going through my mind. Like here, here's me now. I'm doing this. Yep. Yep. I, I mean, I never thought it would happen to me, but um, <laughs> at this point, it doesn't really matter. So. Yeah, I mean, you have to look at it as a blessing that you fell, quote unquote, to the third round. Like that's pretty darn good, right? Being a third round draft, is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. and, and where you end up makes so much of a difference. So, I mean, we keep reading all these things about people saying you're a good fit. How do you, how do you view your fit you know, with the Saints? I, I love it. I mean, Coach Mike Hodges, the linebacker coach with the Saints, um, called me after and was was pumped up about the different ways they could utilize me in their scheme and blitz packages. And, um, and, and on top of that, I get to play a, a, a new position and showcase my ability there. Um, I have really good vets in front of me. So um, I know I'm going to pick up the game and, and the playbook really fast and lean on them for, for help. Yeah. You're, I mean, you're a pretty smart, intuitive linebacker. So I'm, I'm guessing that you won't have any problem with that, but I'm fascinated by, what you talked about at the senior bowl where they wanted you to diagnose some schemes because they play a four, three, don't they? In New Orleans yep. and you played a three, four in college. So is that difficult for you to have to learn something new on the fly or in some ways is football, football? It is football, football, but, but I think I was such a nuanced linebacker at Wisconsin that 
that kind of helps me because I don't have the long history of playing linebacker. You know, if that makes sense, I don't have bad habits. I don't have um, stuff like that. So it was, it made it very easy for me to transition to Will playing Will linebacker at the senior game. And I, I'm sure it'll be the same at uh, the next level. So yeah, do, you I mean, think do, you, do you think they'll play you inside more than outside? Yeah, without a doubt. Okay. Was versatility, because that was a word that kept coming up when people were talking about your stock in the draft, that you're this versatile guy who can do a lot of things in coverage, rushing the passer. Was that something they talked about with you as what made you stand out on their board as a guy who can do a lot of different things? Yep. He said, we know you can play Sam. That's not a problem. We're gonna, um, we think it's best for you and your career if, if, you, if we kick you inside and have you learn Mike and um, maybe put the green dot eventually on your helmet. And um, I always, that was something I always ask coaches, like, um, is me being as versatile as I am ever a bad thing? And every single coach, every single team said no. Um, it, they need guys. The league's always changing and developing. Um, it's getting faster, more passing. Um, they need guys that can do a lot of different things. So let's talk about New Orleans. When we had you on the podcast back in the fall, you were telling us about your travels, and you said that New Orleans was the favorite place you visited. It's like serendipity, man. It's crazy. It's crazy. So tell so what were some so why was New Orleans your favorite? Let's get into that now. Like what are you looking forward to when you get down there to to see in New Orleans? Yeah, since I've gotten picked, I'll tell you, there's been so many like subliminal messages that I've been noticing in my life that like hinted at me getting picked in New Orleans. I don't know if that's luck or happenstance or what, but um it's really crazy. But New Orleans, gosh, I just like the one, the people there are so different and so unique and so loving and um, so supportive, especially around the, the Saints and, and the team. Um, and then two, the food um, is like none other. Um, I'm excited to go back down. I didn't really get to try everything I wanted to try because I was only there for four days. Um, but I'm really excited for that. Um, and just the city overall. I think is really inducive to um, just their fans and um, just a good lifestyle. They live good down there. What, uh, what advice have you gotten from Bobby April, your linebackers coach at Wisconsin, who is uh, about as Louisiana as it gets a guy who grew up there. His dad coached for the saints for a while. Um, he was pretty fired up when I talked to him about you going to new Orleans. What's your, what's your discussion with him been like so far? He told you yeah. where to eat and all that. Uh huh. And when I was down there before, he was telling me where to eat. So it's kind of, um, it, it's funny that I'm going back. Um, actually, just yesterday, he was helping me find a, a place to live, an apartment. Like, how far is this drive? Um, he was even helping me with like my routes to the practice facility. Like, no, you should probably take this road. It's a got less stop signs. So stuff like that is like, if I if if coach didn't live there, I wouldn't have that stuff and that resource. Um, about the different areas to live in and stuff like that. So um, he, he's definitely been a big help and will be a big help down, uh, down the road. Ryan Ramchek is obviously the other clear connection to Wisconsin. Have you made contact with Ryan yet? Yeah, he congratulated me um, right when I got drafted. Um, I'm just ready to get down there and uh, get those battles going with him again, like the good old days. So what is your timeline? What does it look like? So you're still in Madison right now. You're safer at home like we all are. What, it, what have you heard about getting down there, getting started? Yeah, well, the Saints, I think, is the only team that Coach Payton isn't having us do rookie mini camp, even virtual, OTAs, nothing, none of that. Um, huh. So it's, he pretty much said, be ready to go um, when, when camp comes around, be in shape and um, have the playbook down. So um, the timeline's really up to me. I think before I'm, I'm trying to get down there as soon as I can, but before I do that, I need to find a place to work out, especially during a time like this. It's really hard. I have a pretty good schedule and a, a gym to go to right now. So there'd be no point in me leaving if I don't have a place to train. So I need to figure that out before I, before I go. Okay. So you've heard from Ramchek. You've heard from coach Payton. My real question is, have you heard from Drew Brees yet? Yeah, Drew B's texting me the other day, and uh, <laughs> it was one of those moments I'm like, 
keep it cool, keep it cool, stay cool, stay cool, stay cool. Stay cool. <laughs> and next thing I know, I'm showing my brothers, showing my friends, like, yo, look at this, trying to be cool. But I got to understand that he's just a teammate. It's definitely um, speaks to the um, the leadership on the team. Um, for a guy like that to reach out to a, a third round draft pick is is really big, and that leadership is huge on the team. I mean, that's yeah, a guy that's been in the league since 2001. I mean, how old were you in 2001? I was five years old. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about football yet. <laughs> Did, does it change your perspective a little bit to know that you were that they traded up? One that they traded up for you. Two that they only have four draft picks this season, so they had to make sure like they got to maximize get quality over quantity. That's the, I was reading up about it, and that's what everybody kept saying is the Saints targeted quality over quantity and they've got a really good tradition of being smart draft drafters as, a, as an organization like they've got a really good track record of that does that change your percent perspective or make you I don't know a little more appreciative or grateful or excited I don't know yeah that was kind of my that's really what I wanted out of this whole draft process was someone to want me a team to trade up for me and just come for me and want me for all that I can bring to the team and the defense and that's um, it maybe happened a little later than I wanted, um, but turns out they were trying to um, trade up for me for like an hour or 45 minutes. So they were trying to get me in the early second round, but because they only had a late third round pick, um, it was hard to make an offer um, that far and, and trade up that far. But gosh, they, they just, they, for a team to want you, it's definitely more special than um, me dropping to the third, third round and some, some team saying, oh, I'll pick them up. And for you, it has to be about as stable a situation for a franchise as you could ask for. I mean, you've got, you brought up Drew Brees, you know, the, he's reaching out. He's a clear leader. Sean Payton's been there as the head coach for a number of years already. And this is a team that two years ago was basically a play away from the Super Bowl. They've had these, this string of heartbreaking playoff losses. But I mean, you're joining a contender right out of the gate. Oh, absolutely. Uh, they're that team uh, that, that's always, Push, pushing the limits, always winning their, their division and um, making a, a good playoff run. And like you said, those heartbreaks, obviously. And I, actually, funny story, I, as soon as I got home, so I was at my, parent, my uh, girlfriend's parents' house, and as soon as I got home, I flipped on the, uh, the Vikings game from last year that they lost. And, and I just wanted to feel like, uh, like what they felt. I know it's not exact, but I just want to get in that right mindset and understand how they lost and why um why we're, we're, we're going to be so hungry uh, to win and, and go for it all next year. Why, getting your take now that you've, you've joined the fraternity here, why do you think this program has had such a strong run of linebackers in the NFL? A, in terms of number and getting a large number of linebackers into the league, but then guys finding success. I mean, we had Vince Beagle on the pod last week. He's a guy who's found his footing as a starter now for the Dolphins. You've got T.J. Watt, Gank. You can go down the line. Why do you think – because Wisconsin is not, up until five years ago or so, has not been known for its linebackers. Why, why do you think that's become the way it is now? I really think that Chris Borland set, it all, set the tone, and, and he was kind of the model um, for guys like Joe Schobert and Vince Beagle. Um, guys like them really looked up to guys like uh, uh, Chris Borland and uh, they set the tone. And then I think it was like a waterfall effect of guys just seeing guys, other dudes make it and understand what it took to get there. And, and I think mentorship is huge and guys haven't been stingy about um, releasing their secrets or their ways of the ways of the land with, with younger guys. That's really how I learned. And I know that's how um, guys like TJ Edwards, a, a red shirt, uh, and, and Conley redshirt linebackers, uh, you watch the, the, the linebackers ahead of you, um, how they prepare, how they work, um, all, all that. You're sitting back and you're watching through your development and understanding why so that when it's your time, you're, you're prepared and you're leading the, the Badgers defense your senior year and then really pr projects you into the, the next level. There's no doubt that that's what Wisconsin football is kind of built on. So you mentioned who was mentoring you. So who, who did you mentor? Who's next? Who, who are the young linebackers that 
that you have kind of taken under your wing to impart those secrets and who's going to be sitting there drafted in the third round or first round in, in two years, three years. Yeah. There's a lot of guys that are, I, I just see so much of myself and maybe guys that um, came in and, and play, maybe played a different position. I'm thinking of Jalen Franklin played quarterback in high school, just like myself um, developed obviously the first few years and now has a, a, a true shot at really shining and, and, um, making it to that next level. I think of guys like Isaiah Green may, um, uh, Nick Her Nick Herbig, uh, the, 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 the new guy on, on the block. I've had a lot of connection with him and try to just tell him that where you're at right now, isn't that far from where I was or where, um, you can be. So, um, just kind of cutting that dream in half and, and letting them know that with hard work and, passion for the game and leadership and just being an overall good dude. Um, it's not, your dream isn't as far as, as it may seem. So when you say you've got to prepare to hit the ground running, when you get there, have they sent you the playbook, the saints, like, or, like, or whatever even that looks like, a, like for like the defensive schemes and learning it, they send you clips. How do you do that? How do you learn while you're a thousand miles away? Yeah, it's tough. And we don't have meetings yet. So, um, it's kind of do it all by yourself. Um, they're sending a playbook later this week, I'm pretty sure. And then uh, I made sure to get my Exos password, Thundercloud password up and going. So I <laughs> may not understand why uh, um, we're doing what we're doing, but I, I, I'm, it gives me time to just um, look at the defense, watch practice. I'm actually seeing some Vince Beagle when he was with the Saints uh, in in this film. And just writing my own notes and jotting my own uh, things down and, and trying to get my own understanding before I, I really get a chance to learn. So once you had the relief of yourself coming off the board and being picked and the excitement of knowing you're a saint, did you kind of sit back and keep watching the draft to see where the other guys ended up? I mean, were you in the same boat that we were sort of as fans just waiting and trying to see where those guys would go? Yeah. I mean, Tyler Biotish was, was the next to go to the Cowboys and I was so excited for him and uh, where he went and despite all the adversity he's faced, the, the Cowboys really got a steal. I mean, uh, that, that dude's going to lead that line right away and make an impact right away. And then Q, um, I never thought in a million years he would go to the Lions, but he went to the Lions and I'm excited for him. They got a steal. I mean, there were so many wide receivers in this draft class and um, just so excited for all the guys. And then Chris, um, obviously there was disappointment for him to go undrafted, but I know he's going to make the most of his opportunity nonetheless. Yeah. I mean, the Panthers used, I think all of their draft picks on defense. So they're clearly, that's the side of the ball they're trying to remake. I mean, it seems like that's a great opportunity for him with a new coaching staff to, to try to get his shot. Yeah. He definitely has a good shot too. He was telling me how, uh, before the the last day, the Panthers – I don't know if I, he wants me to tell this, but the Panthers actually called him and, and told him um, if he goes undrafted, um, they got a sweet deal for him. So that was a connection that he, he had. But obviously, you know, Chris, competitive as he is, he wanted to get drafted and um, do that whole thing. And there's there's no secrets with Chris. I mean, we all we all know that whether you tell us or or we have him on later, he's going to tell us. So that's that's no surprise there. He'd be fine with that. Um, but I mean, Patrick and I talked about that last week with the virtual draft and how that changed everything. That the undrafted free agent part of that would probably be a a big change. So would teams be working ahead and making those connections with guys that hey, if you don't go, if you don't go, we've got a deal for you, knowing that it was going to be a circus at the end. Other than, I mean, other than the fact that the commissioner was in his basement and the broadcast was a little different, did doing it virtually take away any of the excitement for you? Did it change anything for you? Or was this the draft as, as you had dreamed it to be? I mean, I have, to be honest, I haven't watched the draft, <laughs> like, <laughs> leading up to this. I'm not, I don't, like, follow NFL football. Um, so I, I really haven't watched the draft. So this is normal to me. This is my normal. It's actually going to be weird when they're in Cleveland next year doing the draft <laughs> and it's in person. But it was seamless. It was seamless. It was flawless. I mean, there was no hiccups, nothing. I mean, some of the reporters, when they were reporting and they had the different uh, 
different people in the sectors. I mean, sometimes they would cut out and they would not answer, but other than that, it was, it was fine. I think how this is affected, uh, the, this was affected the most was the guys that didn't get a chance to have the combine, the pro day, the chance to meet with teams in person. And I think you really saw that play out and, and guys like, like Chris, maybe he even got his pro day in, but we're affected by not being able to show his face and show his personality in front of these coaches. Yeah. We talked about that, that he's a guy that he wows you, you know, when you meet him in person. So not having that FaceTime and it would be a detriment for a guy like him, but I think he landed on his feet. He'll be all right. Hey, I got a question for you. Have you seen the documentary Gleason? I have not. No. Okay. I got homework for you. It's, it's a documentary. Yeah. Write this down. This is, this is part of your saints uh, research. So Steve Gleason was a defensive back for the saints and he's got Lou Gehrig's disease. And so the documentary is about a span in his life where he was a Saints player. He's a hero in that city because he blocked a punt in a playoff game. Oh. You know who I'm talking about now? Yeah. Hey, right when I got drafted, Coach April sent me a, a picture of – he's like, um, this is his name. This is what he looks like. He's the heart, heartbeat of their uh, the, the association. Look this guy up and really know who he is. Yep. Okay, I think okay, it's on okay. – I think it's on Netflix or Amazon Prime. It's on one of those. You got to find it. It's, it's an amazing documentary. It's an amazing story. He's, a, he's an inspiration to people who, if you're not even a Saints fan, he's an inspiration. It's a, it's a, it's a challenging watch because it's emotional because you see him dealing with Lou Gehrig's disease. Yep. But, but that's, part of your, that, that'll be, that's part of your Saints indoctrination is, is getting to know that because, yeah, he's a, he's a hero in that city. I'll definitely do that. I'll definitely do that. Yeah, I'll watch a, that. It's a cool city and a cool fan base you, you're going to get to be a part of. It's pretty awesome. I'm excited. Yeah, congrats, excited. Zach. We're proud of you. We're happy for you. And now you got you to gotta learn some Cajun uh, on the way out here. So I, I don't even – I can't say it very well, but it's like, Les allez bon temps roulé. It's let the good times roll in French. Les allez bon temps roulé. Roulet, yep, you practice that. And then when you get down there, you say that to somebody and they'll say, okay, you're a Cajun. Yeah, you're good. You're okay, Creole. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Congrats, right, Good luck, buddy. Thanks. You. Thank you. All right, my French is terrible. Uh, that was an embarrassment that I even tried to do that. But I think we need to try and get Zach on a few weeks, see if he has mastered that, that phrase. Uh, He's a fun guy to have on. I'm, I'm, I'm super, super excited for him and proud of him. So, Mason, we've talked about this year's draft. There were four Badgers drafted, five on NFL rosters that will be rookies. What does next year look like? Let's forecast this out a little bit. The 21, 20, 2021 draft in Cleveland next year. Who, who do you think will be, uh, be on that big board for the Badgers? Well, it's Wisconsin, so you've got to start with offensive linemen. I think Cole Van Lannan, a guy who's had experience at left tackle, will probably be at the top of that list for teams that uh, is a guy they're looking at. Uh, Isaiah Loudermilk on the defensive side. He's physically everything you'd, you'd want in an NFL player on the defensive line. And then a guy like Jake Ferguson at tight end, who would have another year past this one of eligibility. But if his, uh, his growth curve continues, you know, he's a guy that I think will certainly get interest from NFL teams and would have potentially a chance to leave early if, if he wanted to. Um, those are probably the three headliners that I, I can think of. But then Jim Nagy, the director of the Senior Bowl, already tweeted out his quarterback board for 2021, Jack Cohn. Obviously, he'll be right in the mix um, as a quarterback. You know, you got Danny Davis at wide receiver. Um, one that I think is really interesting is Mason Stocky. Um, given the Badgers' pedigree of fullbacks, and I mean, Brady Ewing was drafted as a fullback. You had Derek Watt drafted as a fullback. Alec Ingold's killing it as a undrafted free agent for the uh, for the Raiders so here's a guy that wasn't even on the Badgers radar necessarily last uh, going into last year who's already made an impact so I don't know Mason's a guy that's sort of a wild card for me and then you can keep going on with Garrett Rand you know can Noah Burks uh, have a great season and do something like a Garrett Dooley did where he got an NFL chance based off of how well he played as a senior at outside linebacker um, Caesar Williams is a guy who made a bunch of plays corner last year for the Badgers uh, and then the safeties Eric Burrell Colin Wilder that'll be seniors you know, um, Colin hasn't had a lot of tape. Eric's made a lot of plays. So I think there's plenty of guys that will be in the mix um, whenever, this, whenever this season can, can get going and they can start putting 
more of what they've got on film for NFL teams. Yeah, that's one of the things that I love about Wisconsin's program and the developmental ways of it is all those names you said kind of later in that, in that uh, phrasing there are guys where like a year from now or a year ago at this time, Quintez Cephas was not, uh, <laughs> definitely was not on, on draft radars. Uh, Zach Bond was not thought of as a early round pick. So, no, poten- potential. He, he was a potential guy, but, but an unknown, necess- you know, sort of. Um, and he went out and had a great year and proved it. So yeah, certainly so there there's, will be there's a guy, guys in that list. that can. Yeah, there will be a guy who a year from now we're going, we're going wow, what a year he had and, and didn't necessarily see that development coming. All right, that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. We really appreciate all the support. Uh, we hope that you are all staying, staying healthy, staying happy. Uh, and May is here. We're getting good. We got, finally have good weather around Wisconsin. So hope you guys are all enjoying it. And, and uh, we'll catch up with you again next week.